evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us here today. I'm Annapurna Mitra. I head the Green Transitions Initiative at the Observer Research Foundation, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our session on Capital Conviction, The Road to Glasgow. Today, we'll be talking about climate finance and, more importantly, the need for climate finance to flow rapidly from the global north to the global south in order to ensure that both climate and development goals are met in the decade we have ahead of us for action. To set a little bit of context, since Paris, recent commitments in the last five years or so have tilted more towards domestic growth strategies and unilateral targets rather than cooperation. This seems to be changing recently. The G7 announced that they would work to scale up climate capital and to meet the $100 billion target of aid. More recently, a meeting with Prime Minister Modi and John Kerry, the United States Climate Envoy, touched on providing capital and technology if there is a clear climate target. And of course, now we're looking forward to the Biden administration's first climate summit later this month. So given this context and the hope we have on the path to Glasgow, we want to talk about what more can be done, how can we enhance the pace of climate capital flows across borders. And to discuss this, I have with me very special guests today. One is Lord Nicholas Stern. He is the Ashley Patel Professor of Economics and Governance at the London School of Economics and chairs the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. He's best known for the Stern Review of 2006, the first ever bit of research that really laid out the economic costs of climate change and also the economic case for climate action. Also with us is Mr. Jayant Sinha. He's a Lok Sabha Member of Parliament and also the Chairman of the Parliamentary Standing Committee for Finance. More importantly, he's an enthusiastic proponent of climate action in India and recently introduced a piece of legislation to the Indian Parliament advocating for a legally binding net zero target for India. I'm delighted to have both of you here with me today and I look forward to hearing your views. So let me hand over to you for opening remarks briefly. First, Lord Stern, maybe just two to three minutes and then Mr. Sinha. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Annapurna, and thank you to the ORF uh, and its work across uh, so many subjects, but in particular for creating and taking forward the Ricina Dialogue. Um, and it's also a great pleasure for me to share a platform with Giant again. Um, I've done that in the past and it's always been uh, a special pleasure. My last flight 14 months ago was from India. I was hoping that my next flight uh, now would be to India to take part physically. Alas, that's not to be. But I still hope that the next time I get on an aeroplane, it will be to come to India, where I've been working uh, with an enormous pleasure for, for since 1974. Now, um, this is about climate and development. It's about the investment for climate and development and the finance for that investment. It's very important that the logic is like that. What is it we're trying to do? We're trying to manage climate and promote development. We're, we know that investment is central and we know that we have to finance that investment. You can't just dive straight into finance without setting that logic clearly. Now, the coming two decades will be absolutely crucial for India's development and its contribution to the world. Um, during this time, India will face perhaps the most important economic, social and environmental transitions in its history. Let me set out the six dimensions very quickly, which the investment must drive forward. A massive energy tra first, massive energy transition with a doubling of electricity generation in each of the next two decades whilst driving to net zero power. Second, expansion of sustainable transport, including by shifting freight from road to rail and inland water transport. Massive scaling up in urban transport and the accelerated phase out of the internal combustion engine in all forms of transport. Third, improving urban infrastructure and services at a time of unprecedented urbanisation. Fourth, 
preserving and rebuilding environmental and natural assets, including sustainable agriculture, restoring degraded land, tackling the availability and use of water, and expanding India's forest cover. Fifth, accelerating industrial and technological transformations through policies and investment that can drive economies of scale and bring down costs. Cooling and battery storage, clear examples. And sixth, very importantly, building resilience in all systems and for society, of not only in relation to climate, but also health and social protection. Those six areas will be definitional for India's investment. It will be in, it will be and development. It will be India that chooses and shapes those investments. But those six areas are fundamental. They're core both to India's development goals and to its contribution to global sustainability. Now, managing these transitions well will not be a cost but a historic investment opportunity. They will not close India's options, but rather they will expand India's options. India has shown in LEDs and lighting and in solar how commitment and scale can drive down costs. India has been a pioneer. The transition to a low carbon economy driven by investment and innovation holds an enormously promising future for India and is the only sustainable path for its people and the planet. On the other hand, staying on the current path, the high carbon path, will lock India in cap in, into capital and technology that will become pro progressively costly and unsustainable. In other words, it closes options. We have to be very clear, however, that for these, for to realise these investments on the scale that India is seeking, and quite rightly seeking, we must have clarity on the direction of travel, because otherwise, those investments could not be realised. People don't invest in, uh, in situations of real uncertainty about where everything is going. But clarity on where things is going will be fundamental to generating that investment. Indecision discourages investment. And a high carbon strategy is no longer, it's clearly no longer, no longer a credible direction. So to open up the options to generate the investment, now is the moment to set a strong path for sustainable and resilient and inclusive investment for India. The scale of the investments is immense. India's already launched an ambitious infrastructure program, and rightly so, for $1.5 trillion over the next five years. Arguably, that should double over the five years that follow that. So India should be ambitious in its goals. All friends of India would wish that and would work and try to help make that ambition into reality. But it has to, in setting those goals and charting the investment, be clear to the world the urgent need and opportunity for strong international support and, co and cooperation on technology and especially on scaling up finance, especially from the international financial institutions and in partnership with the private sector. That is the context for which finance is so important, but in finance will follow investment if the conditions are right. And I hope that will be what we'll discuss in the next coming minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, and it's the perfect moment to have Mr. Silha talk about his efforts to set the policy goal that you spoke about so eloquently just now. Mr. Silha, over to you. Thank you uh, very much, Anapurna, and a very good evening uh, to uh, everybody who's watching uh, this program. Uh, and a very good evening to my good friend and colleague, uh, Lord Stern, who has uh, always has eloquently laid out uh, the case for action now, the case for massive investments now. And a very big thank you uh, to ORF and to the Raisina Dialogue for making it possible for us to have these very productive conversations about what we need to do. I very much agree with Lord Stern, and I think he's very uh, articulately laid out uh, what we need to do and the fact that we need to act now. There is no doubt that by mid-century, we have to get to net zero globally. And if we have to get to net zero globally, India, that's uh, at about three and a half billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalents, cannot be in a situation where if we continue on our Paris commitments, uh, we are producing more than 10 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. The world cannot get to net zero if India is over 10 billion tons. So we have to get on a net zero trajectory. And the case I make 
uh, is that this can only be done by the private sector. This can only be done by private capital investing. Governments, because they have a whole host of other challenges and commitments, uh, simply cannot make those kinds of investments. This has to be done by the private sector. And it has to be done now. Hundreds and billions of dollars of investments have to start flowing into the green economy as soon as possible to enable India to peak quickly and then to be able to go into dramatic decline thereafter. Uh, so uh, what we need to begin to think about is how is it that we can enable private capital to make these kinds of investments. And there I want to challenge an orthodoxy that exists among many people which believe that there is a trade-off between net zero and development. I argue exactly the opposite. My argument is that to really turbocharge development, we've got to get on a net zero pathway. By getting onto a net zero pathway, we will attract the trillions of dollars of investments we require. And it is simple economic intuition that when you invest trillions of dollars in the economy, you're going to create high quality jobs and drive economic growth. Uh, it's absolutely trivially uh, it's obvious that that is the case. If you don't make investments, you don't grow the economy. It's as simple as that. And exactly as Lord Stern said, the best investment opportunity, the most amazing investment opportunity we have ever seen in our lifetimes, an order of magnitude bigger than the internet uh, has been, is going to be transforming to the green economy. Now, if that's the way in which we have to do it, we have to do it now and we have to do it through the private sector. The really important question then becomes, and I speak as somebody who's an investor, both as a venture capitalist and then as, a, as an investor uh, uh, in technology uh, for many, many years. We have to do it by making three very important commitments. The first important commitment that we have to make to attract these trillions of dollars of private capital uh, is exactly as Lord Stern said, make it crystal clear uh, that India is going to go to net zero and that this is a legally binding commitment. And I don't mean it from a sovereign point of view in a multilateral treaty. I mean it domestically through an act passed in parliament or through the appropriate constitutional changes that are required. So we set up a climate commission like we've got a finance commission. We allocate carbon budgets and we say we are going to drive the economy to net zero and attract the investment necessarily. So number one, we've got to set a legally binding net zero target and, and really spur investment because there's absolute clarity on the direction of travel, as Lord Stern said. Number two, we have to create, a, create an array of financial institutions. Uh, I just spoke in Parliament where we passed the bill for the development finance institution that's going to be able to mobilize tens of billions of dollars, but we've got to be able to mobilize hundreds of billions of dollars. We will need many, many green funds that are working on uh, you know, various green investments, both uh, in uh, the infrastructure area as well as in various other areas, as Lord Stern has already outlined. So we will need an array of financial institutions that are making these kinds of investments. And number three, it's very important that they get the appropriate regulatory support. And when I say the regulatory support, I mean in terms of monitoring and compliance. So if people are saying I'm raising money uh, to be able to reduce carbon emissions, who's measuring that? How is that being measured? What is the score keeping associated with it? Uh, whether it's the Reserve Bank of India or the Securities and Exchange Board of India, both of which as uh, statutory bodies fall within the purview of the Standing Committee on Finance, which I chair. We've got to establish the right standards so that we can measure this. And very importantly, for the Reserve Bank of India, uh, as far as climate risk is concerned, because we are making 30 year investments already right now in infrastructure in mortgages and so on, they have to find a framework as other central banks are doing to be able to incorporate climate risks in their assessment. And if you've not taken climate risks into account, the cost of capital has to go up because you're taking unhedged risk around the climate. So as I said, this has to be driven by private capital. It has to be driven now. And there are three important requirements. One, India has to make it crystal clear that there's a legally binding target uh, for net zero. Number two, we have to have an array of financial institutions that are pursuing this. And number three, we have to have the appropriate regulatory and policy support to be able to make this happen. That's the only way we can mobilize the trillions of dollars of capital that are required to fundamentally transform our economy into a green economy. I call it getting to the green frontier getting to the green frontier through a variety of net zero pathways. But that ultimately, 
uh, that ultimately is going to build for us a hyper competitive economy that is genuinely sustainable and resilient as lord stern pointed out and that's why i think you know the honorable prime minister's goal of an atma nirbhar bharat uh, self reliant bharat is i think a bharat that's on the green frontier it's a bharat that is a net zero economy thank you very much anupurna Thank you very much, and I think you raised a really important point there about green investment being the growth strategy, and we're seeing that happening already in advanced economies. So UK had the green industrial strategy. The Biden stimulus is putting the US ahead of everyone else in the world, essentially in terms of speed of recovery from the crisis. And the other thing you said is that it needs to be private finance that funds it, and you laid out quite clearly what. the indian regulatory and governance architecture needs to do to attract that private finance would you both like to speak a little about the international regulatory architecture and how that can be also shaped to encourage such flows of funds and specifically one point i'd like to raise is that the impression you have and what you see talking to investors is that they look at still emerging market investments as a short term profitable investment which looks much more at you know governance political business cycle risks than the longer term climate risk and what can we do to change that in the international regulatory architecture so maybe lord stern first and then mr sinha again but let, let me begin by saying how strongly i agree with what my friend giant has just described this is the future for india india can lead the world um when india puts its mind to something you see how fast things can happen you know i worked in um an indian village during the 1970s and saw the india's green revolution in action you know i mentioned the leds and the crashing of the price of leds through indian action india's led on uh, solar So I do think that as India drives towards its green frontier, as Jayant described, it will actually do a lot of driving for the world, and it will gain from other countries driving in that direction too. So first to record the strong agreement with what Jayant has described as the growth story. Then it's the growth and development story of the 21st century, and so often discussions on this subject are locked in last century. That to be clean is costly. To be clean is a burden. That that's just not right. Uh, I'm not sure if it is ever right, but it's certainly not right now. And um, you know, you get cities where you can move and breathe and be productive. That sounds like a good idea, even if you've never heard of climate change, particularly actually in Indian cities, as we all uh, know uh, very well. So, full agreement with Jaya on the uh, strategy. It's a 21st century strategy. It's not the lock into the 20th century uh, strategy. Now, finance will follow investment if. the conditions of the investment are strong and risk is managed well and you know you see very many you know some people think of 150 trillion world dollars under institutional management but not much of that is in infrastructure perhaps just a few percent and very little in emerging market infrastructure so the challenge is to ask why is that the case how we can change it and a lot of it is about perception of risk and risk management so the policies that are going to drive it's not all infrastructure of course but a lot of it is um the policies that are going to drive the investment must be clear and strong now people will need to see those revenue streams so that does mean that policies for example in electricity policies an example of the transport have to give the confidence to investors to put long term money and i'm sure they can do that so what does the international finance system have to do well it should support those kinds of policies that and institutional structures and i fully agree with giant about in the institutional structures being crucially important it has to support policies and institutional structures that give that investment confidence but we know that that's still not enough um infrastructure all investments but particularly infrastructure but large investments have early stage risk and it's not always easy for the private sector by itself to manage that early stage risk and that's why the development finance institutions which giant made central 
to the historian, and I fully agree, those uh, have to be there to help with the early stage risk. So, for example, it should be a dedicated policy for the uh, World Bank, for the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, for the Asian Development Bank, for those banks which are international development banks which are working in India to really focus on how they can help with the early stage risk. They'll need support from the G7 and other countries in having the concessional, some concessional capital to help with that early stage risk, including, for example, climate investment funds in, in the World Bank. So the first answer on the finance side is to focus the attention of the MVBs on um, the management of policy risk, working, of course, with the Indian government, because it's the Indian government that chooses those policies and institutions to handle early stage risk. Secondly, the international institutions should think about how to um, develop those projects into long-term investable um, activities for the long-term investment institutions. So how, once you've got through those early stages, uh, how do you help take out the uh, finance of the, in, the, of the public institutions like the MDBs and help bring in the private finance. So there's a crucial role in those two parts of the finance story, early stage risk and then the takeout finance that turns these things into nice, as it were, revenue producing long term assets, which the institutional investors can put their money in. So we need to re reform our international institutions to enhance, I mean, they, they, they do these things, but we need to uh, give them extra resources and extra focus so that they're working there with the Indian uh, government to set the framework for the private investment which Jayan described so uh, eloquently and to work with the new Indian uh, finance institutions that Jayan described to make that a joint process. Then you will start to see the funds flow in really big numbers. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Tira. Yeah, so let me add to uh, what Lord Stern has very correctly said. And thank you, uh, Lord Stern, for agreeing uh, with my initial observations. Uh, it's always great to get your endorsement on these matters. Uh, let's understand the role of, you know, first the multilateral financial institutions and then global financial institutions. So if you look at investment flows into India, uh, you know, the multilateral financial institutions, uh, the IFC, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, uh, uh, the Asian Infrastructure Bank, all of these various, uh, uh, you know, multilateral financial institutions uh, contribute perhaps 10% of the financing in India, whether it's on the debt side or on the equity side. So the private sector financial institutions, the global financial institutions like a BlackRock, like a Temasek, like the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, the CPPIB, the Canadian Pension Funds, the Australian Super Fund, these are 10x bigger than any of the multilateral financial institutions. So the multilateral financial institutions can only play a catalytic role. They can't form the bulk of the investment. So while we constantly keep talking about, well, what's, you know, the US going to give us or what the European Union is going to give us on a government to government basis, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We really have to look at, are we making it uh, very attractive for Temasek, for the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, for Adia, for you know the Canadian pension funds and the Australian pension funds to invest. If we make it attractive for them, we'll get plenty of capital. There is no shortage of capital uh, on this planet. So the role, therefore, that multilateral financial institutions have to play is a role where they can actually uh, lead this private sector capital in coming in. And to lead the private sector capital, I think there are two very important things that they, they have to do. One I've already said, which is help establish the standards, right? So what are in fact the green standards and how should those be uh, set up so that they are globally aligned? And there's already work that's being done through the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board and so on. But we need to agree on some global standards so that, you know, if Temasek is investing in India because it's a green investment, Temasek knows exactly what it's going to get in terms of impact, right? And 
uh, that that is that is well established. Everybody agrees on that. Just like we agree on uh, you know the global accounting standards, IFRS, etc. We should agree on what the sustainable accounting standards are. So standard setting and establishing protocols is this a green bond, not a green bond? All that has to be clarified. That's very important. I think. Uh, the multilateral financial institutions can do. The second is a seeding and anchoring role. Again, as I said, we need an array of financial institutions. Now, the DFI is one example, but we want, which has been set up by the government, we want public sector DF, uh, private sector DFIs as well. So why don't you come in and be an equity investor in these private sector DFIs? Why don't you become an anchor 10, 15% investor in five green funds? I can tell you because, of course, I have many colleagues that have tried that. You try and raise money from the IFC or you try and raise money uh, from any multilateral financial institution. It will take you three years to do that. We don't have three years now. We don't have three years. If I go to uh, you know, a good sovereign wealth fund or a family office uh, or one of the, you know, the, the fund of funds, they can make decisions within a month. So the multilateral financial institutions, I know they're big bureaucratic organizations, but they've got to move fast. And they've got to go out and exactly as Lord Stern said, take the early risk. And they have to anchor 50 funds that are operating in India because that's the scale of what we have to solve for as a problem. So they've got to move fast and they've got to set standards. The rest, the private sector will take care of. And I'll just conclude by saying the following. In the last five years, more than $250 billion of private equity and venture capital has come into India. We've got 240 unicorns now in India. We have changed the nature of capitalism in India from being you know, a, a mix of state capitalism and dynastic capitalism, which is what the Indian economy was, to very much entrepreneurial capitalism. We have lots of very fast moving, excellent startups that are being funded by the private sector through private equity and venture capital. I myself have spent uh, a lot of my own uh, work in helping establish an alternative assets industry in India, which is now very substantial. So that's happening. We have venture capital funds, we have private equity funds, we have hedge funds. All of that infrastructure has been put in place. The regulations are put out there now. We've got to get the green standards and we've got to seed and anchor Array, an array of financial institutions. And that's really what we need from the multilateral financial institutions. With that catalytic role, uh, they will see hundreds of billions of dollars streaming in uh, because uh, I think, uh, as I said, this is the best investment opportunity we'll see in our lifetimes, for sure. I, I think what Jan said is, is, uh, is, is very wise, and it's uh, not wise static, it's wise dynamic, which is the best form of uh, wisdom. And I think we have to look to the international financial institutions, and of course those who, uh, the rich countries that provide concessional capital to partner them, to focus on the private sector multipliers, to focus on the speed, to focus on the helping of putting the in institutional infrastructure and the policies together because they do have some experience in, in different places and helping doing that. So that's how we should uh, judge their performance. That's where we should set their objectives and criteria. But we must recognize that for substantial amounts of this, the rich countries are going to have to get behind them. You can't just tell them to go and do this and not provide them with the capital resources to do it. But telling them to focus on the private sector multiplier, telling them to increase scale, uh, whilst at the same time you provide them with the resources to pursue that action is uh, absolutely fundamental. And we also have to recognise that some part of this will have to be public sector investment. I fully agree with Giant on the, em the Giant on the emphasis on the private sector, but some parts of urban infrastructure, for example, will be public sector finance. And it's very important that the domestic finance institutions and the international financial institutions help on that as well, whilst not losing the focus on the private sector multipliers. Thank you. And I like what you said about public finance being needed a bit just because we recently had India's first green municipal bond issued. And hopefully it's the first of many. But I think more interestingly, I'd like to hear a last word from Mr. Sinha because we're close to running out of time on the public finances itself. And one risk we see, of course, is that public finances are dependent on fossil fuels to some extent in India on coal, but also on revenues from petroleum, natural gas, 
um, and so on. So how exactly can we navigate that? Because again, if you shrink the pool of public finance, you shrink what you have to even catalyze more private finance. And do you have any thoughts on that, sir? Now, Anupurna, you've touched on some very complex and difficult issues of India's public finances uh, and our dependence uh, on fossil fuels thereof. Uh, just to give you two factoids on that, we are currently generating about 5 lakh crores. That's about $75, $80 billion worth of tax revenues uh, from uh, you know our taxes on petrol and diesel. Right, and five lakh crores is a, is a huge amount of money uh, as far as government of India is concerned. If that starts to go down, uh, you can imagine uh, what happens to our overall fiscal situation. Uh, given that our uh, total government revenues, I think, are about uh, uh, fifteen percent, about uh, you know thirty lakh crores. So it's about you know some fifteen or twenty percent of our total fiscal revenues are coming from fossil fuels right so it's a, it's a major aspect of our uh, fiscal financing so that's one that's one aspect of it the other aspect of it is that coal uh, is actually propping up indian railways right so indian railways basically generates the vast amount of its revenues and all its profits from transporting coal around the country from uh, coal mines to power plants right and if you were to take that freight revenue away from Indian railways is very difficult for Indian railways to operate. So there are many important institutions in India, whether it is the railways, whether it's coal India, uh, whether it's state government that are reliant on coal and mineral revenues and so on. And of course, the government that's reliant on fossil fuel taxes. And how we transition away from this dependency on fossil fuels over time, as I said, is a very complex problem, but it is a massive problem that will require us uh, over a period of 30, 40 years to very carefully think through the fiscal roadmap associated with that. The good news, of course, is as the economy grows on the renewable side, on the uh, low carbon, net zero carbon side, there will be opportunities to uh, generate revenue there. But how this rebalancing of our fiscal picture uh, will happen over time requires some very serious modeling to understand. And I'll just uh, conclude with saying that we have a very serious, as a result of that stranded assets problem that we need to think about. Uh, whether it is Indian Railways, which could be a massive stranded asset, or our coal-fired power plants, or much of our urban transportation infrastructure, uh, we run the risk uh, of uh, very substantial stranded assets, which will, of course, then create NPA problems for our banks and everything else. And that's why it's so important on the Reserve Bank of India to start to begin to think about this. Uh, sadly, not just in India, but around the world, because of these kinds of very deep intractable issues uh, on the public finance side and because of stranded assets, the temptation has always been to kick the can down the road. Uh, but as Mother Nature is telling us, you know, we've kind of reached the end of that strategy. <laughs> so it's time to ask these difficult questions. Can I just uh, fully agree again with John that the public finances will be at the heart of all this? One recognizes the difficulties, looks for alternative forms of taxation, like, uh, for example, uh, congestion charges. Uh, in the meantime, you know, you can increase the uh, carbon taxes. Um, and of course, there's a lot that can be done in, uh, in, in local public finance around property taxation. And the reform to the GST in India um, opens up new possibilities in uh, indirect tax revenue. So this is a journey on the uh, public finances, which is very important, not always easy, but delay in action on sustainability will make those public finance problems more intractable, not less. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry we have to end now. It's been a fascinating conversation and I didn't get to ask most of the questions on my list. But thank you again to both of you and we hope you're right and we hope that we'll be moving towards a clear policy direction soon enough and that it will direct all the finance in your needs. Thank you again. Goodbye. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.